All right, so Julio is going to be telling us about graviton dominance from extremal black hole scattering. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank, let me thank the organizers for making this happen despite the circumstances and for letting me speak about this work. So I will speak most about this paper, we, which came out a few hours ago with uh, Michael Roof, which is a student in Freiburg, and Mao Zeng, which is a postdoc at ETH in Zurich, and also a little bit about this earlier work uh, with, with Zvi and, and Harald. And, and this is kind of a sequel to a very beautiful paper by, by Simon Karnwad and Zara Zari, uh, which came out a, a year and a half ago, more or less. Okay, so uh, today we had many interesting talks, and uh, I think it's clear that amplitudes has caught up to the state of the art uh, in calculations relevant for gravitational wave physics, or at least we've got the attention of the, of the, of the community, which most, most of them are here today uh, watching. Uh, but I think we need to look ahead and we need to ask ourselves what's next, uh, where to start. And if there's something that we've learned by calculating scattering amplitudes, is that if we want to go here, we want to calculate something in QCD, it's usually a good idea to start here, to start in a much simpler theory where we can uh, fit things in our brain instead of on our computer and we can answer some conceptual questions and develop our tools. So. I propose that we do the same thing with, with uh, gravity. So of course, ultimately we are interested in LIGO physics in Einstein gravity, but today I'll be talking about N equals A supergravity, which is a much simpler theory. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna be thinking about uh, extremal black holes in N equals A supergravity, non-spinning. Okay, so the graviton multiplet, the massless multiplet in N equals eight. In addition to the graviton, it also has 28 uh, vectors, which we call gravity photons, and a bunch of scalars, semitic scalars. And there's a bunch of fermions that we won't be interested in. Okay, and then we are going to have some extremal black hole, which essentially we will think of it as some half VPS multiplet, and in particular its scalar component. Uh, so we won't be interested in spin. And you can think of, of, of these black holes as exchanging all of these massless states uh, and interacting through them. Okay, so how, how these black holes interact with these massless multiplet is um, explained by, by a set of central charges. Uh, um, and uh, essentially there's three angles that tell you how the central charges of two black holes are aligned or misaligned. Okay, and uh, so this arrow here is meant to represent that, that charge and, and those angles, not, not the spin of the black hole. And for instance, we know that uh, the force uh, between these black holes in the static limit, because they're BPS particles, uh, it, it vanishes when, when the charges are aligned. So the, Gravitational interaction exactly cancels the, uh, the interaction with the scalars and vectors. Okay, uh, and as the rest of the talks today, we will ignore these finite size effects, or at least uh, we will uh, we want to look at these higher dimension operators which encode them. But let me just point out that here, because we have supersymmetry, they should be much more constrained than in the general case that some people have been discussing. So probably any effect we would push to a higher order. Okay, so what is the calculation that I want to do? So I want to calculate the scattering angle of, of these two black holes, which are just moving, coming on from infinity, scattering, going off to infinity again. And I want to look at the angle uh, where I only take into account the conservative dynamics. Um, okay, so we won't be looking at radiation today. And because I think there's a dearth of uh, two-loop results in the literature, we decided that uh, we wanted to add this uh, landmark calculation by, by Zvi and collaborators, another uh, two-loop result uh, for, for N equals A supergravity. Okay, so the, the calculation that, that Zvi and friends did, well, they used well-established amplitudes methods for, for constructing the integrand. They used the unitary method. And then for integration, they used more modern tools, this EFT for PM scattering. They did this integral level subtraction that canceled all the IO divergences. And then they used some non-relativistic integration method that, that then they resumed in velocity. Okay, and then they used just textbook uh, uh, Hamiltonian dynamics to calculate the, the scattering angle. Okay, but somehow these tools are a bit more new and, and in particular they have in question in, in, in some paper. Um, and so we wanna follow a completely different route and use independent methods. Uh, okay, so even though unitarity is very well established, here we will use a KK reduction to build the integrand because we know these integrands for N equals A to very high loop orders and we can, we can use them. And for, we, for integration, we developed a new, uh, a new method using differential equations to, to calculate the full velocity dependence without relying on any resonation. And also we use standard dimensional regularization. Okay, and then for the scattering angle, we use the, the iconal method um, that I will briefly review. 
Okay, uh, so let me start by the integrants. So the loop integrants for, for any pole state supergravity, they're known up to five loops, which is a pretty high PM order. Uh, thanks to the work of, of a lot of people in the context of view divergence and supergravity. And it wouldn't be an amplitudes conference if, if there was no uh, talk about multi-loop calculations, uh, even though this time it's only two loops. Uh, so I'm happy to give this talk. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and these integrants are valid in the dimensions, which, uh, which means we can just do KK reduction to get massive integrants and integrants for massive particles in four dimensions. So generically, we can start of this, we can think of these integrants as being valid in, in 10D, in type 2A supergravity, and we reduce. So there's the 4D component of the momentum, and there's a transverse component. Uh, and then the reason why I drew arrows on the black holes is because, okay, the general three angle case for the DPS charges is very interesting because the black holes are dionic and they carry magnetic and electric charges and uh, the interactions are more complicated. But if we just use KK reduction, if we have two transverse vectors, there's only one angle between them. So we can only capture the case of one angle misalignment. Uh, but on the other hand, the integrand is for free. So you can see that that the extra dimensional momenta become these DPS charges. If you just look at the su supersymmetry algebra, they, you can see that what is the momentum in higher dimensions just becomes this DPS charge. Okay, uh, and then th these vectors, the, the, the magnitude of, of the extra, the transverse uh, momenta essentially gives you the mass of the particle. Then the kaluk klein reduction, it's very simple because in particular at two loops, all the integrands are just scalar integrals. Uh, so the procedure is very simple. You take some, sim some um, massless graph of two loops and then you try to root the massive particles through in, in all possible ways. And in particular, we are throwing away any interaction that is mediated by the KK tower. We only keep the exchange of massless particles, okay? Because that's what we're interested in for the long distance dynamics. <clears throat> so this is the result. Uh, that we have. So the loop, the one loop integral is very simple and it reproduces the result by Simon and Zara that there is only boxes. Uh, and then the two loop integral is also pretty simple because it only has scalar integrals. Okay, so here I've written everything in terms of this variable sigma that, uh, that we introduced and, and Q squared is just, it's just the Mandelstam T. Okay, uh, so I will refer to these contributions as ladder integrals and then well, most of these won't matter because of this suppression. We will be interested in the classical limit and I will call this the H diagram. Okay, so this is not too surprising that it's so simple because it's any pole state supergravity at the end of the day. Okay, what about integration? Okay, so we are only interested in the classical limit, um, which is a, the limit of large, large angular momentum where, where essentially these ratios are, are very large uh, compared to H bar. And uh, so we're working in natural units. But in addition to that, we are only interested in, in the classical dynamics. So uh, in principle, the, the, there would be an, another small parameter, which is a velocity, which you can think of the, the right ratio between the uh, time and spatial components of the graviton momenta. So there's many modes inside of a graviton. There's a hard modes, there's a soft modes, which just means they're uh, quantum. Uh, but within those, we have like a more like fine grained distinction by velocity counting into potential and radiation. As you can see, the potential modes are off shell. So these things can be integrated out from our theory. And essentially, whenever we had one of these potential modes uh, here, um, then this will turn into some instantaneous interaction, uh, which we can think of as, as a potential. Okay, uh, so we wanna integrate in this potential region. Uh, and the way we will do that is by using differential equations. So there's some very convenient variables uh, introduced in some very old paper by Sudakov, which basically parameterizes extra momenta like this. And these have the advantage that um, the, these momenta are, are orthogonal to Q. Uh, and this will reduce the number of variables we have to worry about. Okay, so we, when we expand in this classical limit, in this, in this soft limit, the graviton momenta are unchanged, but the matter propagators simplify quite a bit and, and they just depend on this four velocity. Uh, where all the extra dependence has been expanded. Uh, and one can just use ordinary IBP reduction after doing this expansion to reduce to a basis where all the integrals have propagators that look like this. Okay, and because of this relation here, the only dimension, and, and these four velocities are dimensionless, all the dimensional dependence uh, just factors out of the integral. Um, and then the integral just depends on this Y, which is kind of the barred analog of, of sigma. So it's just sigma up to Q, order Q corrections. Okay, so we have uh, fully relativistic differential equations in one variable. 
and uh, we can put this in, in canonical form that uh, Johannes taught us, which is this form here where these A's are just some matrices and, and we call this alpha I the, the symbol alphabet. Okay, so it's convenient to introduce this variable X which rationalizes all, the, all, all these alpha I's. Uh, and then at two loops, we find that the full alphabet is, is formed by, by these three letters. Okay, so this will be familiar to many people where in general, the, the sort of uh, functions you can get if you have this alphabet are called harmonic polylogarithms. Uh, okay, so log of X is just a familiar arc cinch that appeared in the, in the 3PM uh, result by SVN and friends. But also we see that at high orders in epsilon, we find new functions like this uh, dialogue. And even at three loops, there's been also some explorations which show that there's even more new letters. Okay, so I think we, we should keep our minds open and expect that we will have a kind of interesting function showing up at order g to the fourth, even though at this order, all of these things will cancel and only the log x will, will remain. Okay, so this, this integral, these differential equations are valid uh, for the soft integrals. I didn't say anything about velocity counting here. So it turns out that the, this radiation and potential regions is split in this new static limit. So when I take the velocity to be very small, they're just, uh, they don't talk to each other. And, and, and this means that the integrals in the potential region actually satisfy the same differential equations as the soft integrals. And we only need to supply the, the right boundary conditions. Okay, so the full soft integrals include some radiation effects that we, we are not interested in. So we just need to calculate the right boundary condition, which we can do by expanding the velocity. Uh, so essentially we go to the static limit in the right way. Uh, so the graviton propagators, we just expand in small energies and the matter propagators are homogeneous and are unexpanded. And in the end, the integrals that you actually have to calculate, uh, they, they are very easily evaluated by calculating the residues in, the, in these matter propagators. And they're very similar to the integrals that appear in electricity or NRPI. Okay. Uh, all right, so here's the result for the amplitudes. Uh, so at one loop, uh, well, we agree with uh, the result calculating the full subregion by, by these people here for the integrals. Uh, here is just that this is not GR, this is N equals eight, so the numerator is a bit simpler. Okay, and here's a sample of a two loop integral, which is this ladder integral here, uh, where you see it has some more complicated dependence on this logarithm of X on the arc cinch, which when you sum over all the ladder contributions, it just cancels. Okay, so this is the full result for the integrated amplitude in N equals eight. Uh, okay, and in particular includes this arc cinch, which comes from the H diagram and all of these contributions here uh, come from the ladder type diagrams and everything else uh, is suppressed by, by, by um, H bar essentially. Okay, so what, what are we going to do with this? Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to use the Econel method. Uh, so instead of going to impact parameter space, which is what most people do, we are going to do this directly momentum space because it's more, more closely related to what happens in the effective field theory. And, and, and this tells us that the amplitude is a convolutional exponential of, of some phase. So we just expand this exponential and instead of taking an ordinary product, we need to take these convolutions in the, in the transverse space. So it, it is well known that the leading iconal phase essentially resums uh, contribution solars in perturbation theory, which is essentially the leading power for all the ladder type diagrams. And so we will actually use the inverse relation that gives us the phase in terms of, of the amplitude. And okay, so you might complain because people like impact parameter space, but actually these convolutions are trivial to calculate because as I told you, the, the Q dependence is trivial in all of the integrals. It's just some overall factor in front. So everything that we need to know how to calculate is this kind of convolution, which is like a bubble integral. So this is the most complicated thing that we need to, to do to use this iconal approach. Okay, so, uh, well, I was hoping that Emil would go into more detail, uh, but he skipped the, his slides uh, on iconal. So I encourage you to go to the YouTube video and play them in slow-mo uh, because I won't be talking more about uh, iconal. Uh, I'll just tell you the result. The result is that after, after you implement this program, uh, all the latter contributions in the amplitude cancel and they just leave the contribution from the H diagram that you see here. So this is the full iconal phase for N equals eight, which is very simple. Okay, uh, what about the scattering angle? Uh, we already heard in, in Shashan's talk how to do this. Uh, so basically if we transform to impact parameter space and back, uh, we have this formula for the amplitude and by using a stationary phase approximation, we get some formula for the uh, <coughs> momentum transfer which gives us the angle in terms of the, of the phase. Okay, so we can, we can use this formula to calculate uh, the angle uh, at the order we're interested in. Uh, we just have to be a bit careful when, when translating to, uh, to angular momentum because actually this, th this relation shows that this uh, 
this iconal, this impact parameter that shows up in the iconal formula actually points along the, the direction of, uh, of the impact parameter. It's not the or ordinary impact parameter of the momentum transfer. It's not the ordinary impact parameter, which is perpendicular to the, to the um, center of mass momentum, which, which is this P. Okay. But anyway, one just has to be a little bit careful, and, and this is the result for the angle. So there is no one loop correction, um, as, as shown already basically by Simone and Zara. Uh, and this is just the Newtonian type result. Uh, uh, and actually, we can check that in the probe limit, where we just consider some probe particle moving in the, in the background of this VPS black hole, that, uh, that this is the result, this is the arctangent, which is the same as the Newtonian result. Uh, and you can check that in the probe limit, this term with the arc sinh is suppressed, and these two terms precisely reproduce the, the arc tangent. Okay, all right, so here we use the iconal approach. Uh, if you go to the paper, you will see that we, we did this whole calculation using the EFT method. Uh, so we use, uh, we wrote the EFT that, uh, that Zvi and uh, Clifford and, and Michael and friends uh, wrote. Uh, we did the matching exactly in the way that they did by canceling IO divergent integrals. And, and we get the same result for, for the angle. And also we get a Hamiltonian. Okay, so let me just make some comments very quickly uh, about the difference between the two approaches. So of course this EFT is non-relativistic and, uh, and we use this integral subtraction which avoids calculating higher divergent integrals. Actually the way they did the integration was a loop by loop integration um, which avoids having to worry about epsilon over epsilon or classical hidden quantum uh, so this is kind of a special scheme and, and all of these things one could keep track in, uh, of in the, in the AFT and but essentially they would cancel in the matching. Uh, so, so whatever they did was very efficient to target these classical contributions. Okay, on the other hand, the iconal exponentiation is a, a much older subject um, and okay, it's fully relativistic but you need to establish that the phase actually exponentiates which is a non-trivial thing. Uh, uh, the way we did things, you, one needs to evaluate uh, these infrared divergent integrals, and although uh, it's very suggestive that we can do something very similar to the integral subtraction uh, in, the, in the iconal uh, setting. And this requires higher orders in epsilon and, and Q to check exponentiation, the way we did things. But this is kind of a more standard scheme. You just evaluate the integrals in dim rag in the right region, and then you check the degree exponentiates, and everything works perfect, and both methods agree. All right, so that's uh, what I had to say about the calculation. Uh, let me tell you about a couple of applications which I think are interesting. Uh, so the first one is a beautiful story in, in a paper by Simone and Zara, which uh, showed that there was no precession at order G cubed. This is related to the fact that there was no correction to the angle. And also to all orders in the probe limit, which again, as I showed you for, for this, uh, instead of the precession for the scattering angle, we just get the Newtonian result, okay? Um, and uh, it turns out that at order G cube that we are looking at now, uh, there is no precession uh, ever. Uh, and there's many ways to see this, but one of them is by using this neat formula that, uh, that Gregor and Rafael Porter uh, showed us, uh, which shows that because all, all, odd orders in G are also odd in spin, and whatever contribution that would come from the scattering angle is, is gonna cancel in the sum. So there's no precession at this order, but we see that the angle deviates from the Newtonian result due to this, uh, this contribution here. Okay, so this spells some trouble for, for, for this uh, theory remaining integrable. But of course, th this result is still not the physical angle because it doesn't take into account the effects of radiation. So uh, uh, there's an interesting question, which is whether this term remains in the, in the physical angle. Okay, and another application of this is that uh, uh, in QC limits gravity a couple of years ago, Simon also taught us that, uh, that essentially, uh, at, at least through uh, uh, 2 p.m., um, it seems that uh, this EOV technique that was introduced by Bonanno and Damore uh, is related in some way to some particular dual conformal transformations uh, which are, which are uh, satisfied by the gravity amplitudes. Okay? So this dual conformal symmetry in general is some extension of the Laplace wing length symmetry. And what, what Simone explained is that there is one extra generator which kind of maps you in and out of the probe limit. Um, and, and this term kind of breaks that symmetry at, uh, in this theory at this order. Okay, so, uh, so again, maybe if we look at a physical amplitude, uh, this symmetry is still there, but uh, I, won't answer, I, I, won't, I won't tell you about that today. And the other application is, okay, there's a very famous story by uh, a, a, a Tuft, uh, an old story about uh, how gravity dominates at high energies. So if you have any theory with any amount of matter, if you are scattering particles at high energies at leading order in G-Newton, 
and everything that matters is gravity. And basically, you can think of that scattering process as one particle moving in the background, in the shockwave background, which is created by the other high energy particle. Okay, and, and particularly the leading iconal phase uh, is dominated by, by graviton exchange. Um, and okay, so what about subleading in G? Uh, generically, we don't expect that there is any such a universality at subleading power. Uh, uh, but as, as it turns out, if we take this uh, high energy limit, uh, so we take our result. So it's important that first we take the classical limit and then we take sigma to be large. Uh, then this is the result that we get from n equals eight. And it exactly agrees with the result uh, in Einstein gravity. So this comes from a term in the angle, which goes like sigma to the fourth times the arc cinch. Uh, so it seems that this term is universal uh, and it doesn't depend on the matter content of the theory. It seems that experimentally that uh, it only depends on the fact that we have gravitons. Okay, so we don't understand this. We just found this experimentally by calculating and comparing. Uh, so we were very interesting to uh, find an explanation. Also in the massless case, uh, we saw something very similar in this earlier paper. Um, so there is a, a very recent calculation using uh, the former Black Hat collaboration now called uh, Caravel. They have new technology and they were able to calculate the full quantum to loop graviton amplitude in GR. Uh, so it was a considerable uh, feat. Uh, and uh, so we, we took that and we took the high, high energy limit, the uh, regel limit, which in this case, if you are starting from the massive case, you can think of as taking first the high energy limit where the mass is very small and then the classical limit, which doesn't commute with the previous limit. Um, and uh, okay, so this is the form that the amplitude takes where we have some remainder functions. And if you look at the pieces which are relevant to calculate the iconal phase, it turns out that they are also universal. Okay, so this, uh, um, tells us that the, ang the angle which we calculated, uh, in fact, is also universal. So we did this calculation both in GR and also in N equals four, five, six, and eight supergravity. And we, every time we got the same result. Uh, okay, so this, by the way, it agrees with some older calculation by Amati, Schiapalloni, and Veneziano, which use rigid type methods. And it also disagrees with a more recent proposal by, by them for the same angle. And so again, we don't understand this. So we see this uh, experimentally, we see this, uh, Graviton dominance at subleading power, but uh, it's unclear why this is true. So let me summarize. Uh, I think we've developed new methods for calculating scattering, classical scattering amplitudes. In particular, we have uh, in, uh, used this modern method of differential equations to carry out the velocity expansion without actually expanding the velocity. Um, we have combined this, this calculation with old techniques and well-established techniques like the econo uh, approximation to calculate the scattering angle or extremal black holes in N equals A supergravity. Um, we've uh, shown, again, by explicit calculation that uh, both this older method, the iconal, and the newer EFT methods agree. And this provides some non-trivial confirmation of, of the result by uh, Berman and friends. By the way, the, the, the integrals that we have calculated, there's no new master integral. Uh, so in fact, there's ongoing work to, to also carry out the iconal uh, calculation in GR but essentially all the integrals have already been calculated and it, they agree with, with whatever was done in the previous paper. Okay, so I also told you that there's no precession at order G cube for trivial reasons, but we see that the angle deviates from the integral result. Uh, this pertains to the conjecture by, by Simon and friends, uh, but there's still some puzzles having to do with radiation, et cetera. Um, and perhaps more interesting, we saw that this uh, graviton dominance by two uh, seems to extend to subliving order for both in the massive and massless case. This is very puzzling here. There is no like semi-classical picture of a particle moving in the background generated by the other particle. There's not even a proof. So I think we should, uh, we should think a little bit about this. Uh, and all in all, I hope I convince you that uh, N equals A supergravity, it's an excellent theoretical laboratory uh, to kind of try to answer more conceptual questions and try de to develop calculational tools to apply to these problems in, in gravity. And just going full circle, I think we should be looking to the future and ask uh, what's next. Uh, can we do spinning black holes at two loops in n equals eight? Can we do three loops in n equals eight? Uh, in principle, we can do up to five loops if we can do the integrals. Uh, so, and there's no Feynman diagrams involved. Uh, and with that, I'll leave you with a bunch of words that I think uh, uh, are gonna be relevant in the next few years. And, uh, and if uh, any of those pique your curiosity, I'm happy to talk to you uh, about them and thank you very much.
All right, a virtual round of applause for Julio. Thanks for the great talk. Are there any questions? So is there any evidence um, at three loops in this high energy uh, limit for any kind of universality or not yet at this point? Is there anything known? Uh, no, I mean, we, we essentially can construct the integrand, but uh, we don't know much about the integrals yet. Uh, so there's some res partial results for some of the integrals, uh, but, uh, but this would require not only a calculation in equals eight, but also a calculation in GR uh, or in some other theory, which is uh, much harder. But I think that the n equals a calculation is totally within within reach. Cool. Okay, there's a question from Carlo. Hi, um, great talk. Um, could you explain a bit more uh, explicitly how do you fix the integration constant by uh, by considering the static limit? Um, sure. Uh, let me thanks. go back to that slide. Uh, yeah, so we, we just calculate the boundary condition. So the, the, the differential equations are a differential equation in the velocity. So we essentially take the zero velocity limit in the right region. So if you just calculate the static limit of the full integral, this is not going to be the same as the static limit in the potential region. At one loop, everything is the same because essentially there's no intermediate three particle states. Uh, so you cannot generate any on shell graviton in an intermediate state, and all of these considerations don't matter. But starting at two loops, you could have some intermediate on-shell graviton or some intermediate three-particle state, which, it, which could be soft. And, and in general, that's going to change the result, uh, even for the, for the boundary condition. So of course, we can also use these differential equations to calculate the full soft integrals. And, and Mao and, and Michelle also did that. And, and you just find a different result. And in particular, it doesn't exponentiate. So if you try to carry out the iconal uh, analysis in that case with the full soft integrals, uh, it doesn't exponentiate. So there's uncancelled infrared divergences, uh, which, which are not subtracted by the previous orders. Uh, but so what we do here, it's literally we calculate the, the integral in the potential region using the non-relativistic method in the paper by, by Zvi and friends. And, and that is our one recondition for, for the differential equations. I see. I see. Thanks. Can I ask a question? Sure. Go for it. Do you? So, so it's important for you to take Q, uh, the limit of, of Q going to zero and then sigma going to infinity, but can you interchange those limits? So those limits don't commute. And this is related to the fact that there seems to be a uh, uh, collinear divergence in this, uh, in this arc cinch in, in, in these amplitudes. Uh, uh, so in, generically, if you take the limit in the opposite order, it's like doing fir going first to the massless amplitude where you took the mass to zero, and then you take the, the high energy limit of the masses amplitude. Uh, so it, it, what happens technically is that there's new regions that open up when you take the limit in, in different ways. So the calculation is, uh, is completely different. Uh, and, and this is relevant for the first time for this, basically for this H diagram. So at one loop, there's, there's no such thing. Okay. Uh, Nima has a question. Hey, Julio, terrific talk. Um, uh, uh, is it uh, so surprising, the uh, graviton dominance? I mean, we just have like gravity and scalar exchange, and maybe some vectors, but the scalars and vectors don't couple more and more strongly at, at higher energies. Only gravity does. Uh, it's a little different in something like string theory, where you also have uh, higher spin particles. And so you expect an S to the J. But in general, you would expect to be dominated by the very highest spin there is, and that's just, just gravity. Wouldn't you? Um, uh, uh, is that I think, not a I, think, intuition? I think that that's right. Uh, what, what, what's happening here, which is a bit non-trivial, is that everything else cancels. And essentially, you only get the graphs where that intuition, which is that the leading power in the expansion, of course, is dominated by the gravitons. So if you look at the H diagram, there's, you can see straight away that the H is dominated by gravitons, uh, which is what typically happens. Every time that there's something that appears for the first time in an amplitude, it's typically universal. But, but there's something non-trivial, which is that all the subliving powers, in this, all, these, all these other integrals, don't matter at all, and they don't give any new classical contributions. Uh, I agree that that looks unobvious from the on-shell organization. But I think this is one of the things which is more obvious from the Lagrangian, isn't it? When you go to super high energies, all the vertices couples to scalars are coupling to the trace of the stress sensor that are going to zero. 
but this, this, this is true a leading power or also is growing uh, uh, everything involving the graviton is growing nothing else is growing in the Feynman diagrams I mean I, I mean I, I agree at leading power but uh, but I think uh, one needs to expand and check right uh, because here we're looking in the sense at sub sub leading power uh, where I mean may, maybe it maybe you're, you're right and, and it's it's trivial but at least uh, yeah, I would have Sorry, to think twice sub, about sub, it. Uh, uh, sub leading here means more G Newtons right no, it means uh, like more classical, like uh, like higher powers of, uh, or less powers of Q. So, oh, okay. so it's okay. so so the ladders go like one over Q squared, and one needs to expand okay. up to the logarithm. Right. Okay. To extract Sorry. Then, 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 then I, I may have misunderstood. Uh, David Kostar has a question. Oh, I can't hear you, David. Yeah, my computer was uh, refusing to unmute itself. A uh, very nice talk. Can you comment as to, uh, do you even know exactly how you'd go about adding the radiation effects of this order in this formalism? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, in fact, the, the way we thought about how to do this is to use your formalism <laughs> uh, to calculate the radiation piece, but uh, that doesn't mean it cannot be done. Uh, uh, in fact, one can, we, Typically, one would see that if you have radiation, then there's some, some imaginary part to the phase that one needs to take into account, uh, uh, which just uh, encodes the fact that this, this particle can actually decay and, and the, the four-point amplitude is not exactly a phase. Uh, uh, so in principle, there is some, some organization in which you can separate the pieces which are kind of belonging to the four-point amplitude and having to do with radiation, but how to extract the angle from that uh, I don't know. The re one of the reasons I ask is, is actually that uh, Chris White and uh, Donal and I were, were trying to see if we could derive in our language the, the Eichenol formula. And uh, one of the things that might be a useful hint is if one understood how to incorporate the radiation, because then we can match things more easily, at least conceptually, even if you haven't done the calculation. Right. So it's clear that, for instance, we would have to include the contributions from these soft, these soft or radiation modes, uh, and and because here I would, was only talking about the conservative part, uh, but yeah, but I don't know how to use that piece of the amplitude uh, at this point. And then Lance, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Maybe. To, well, one question is, did you actually need to uh, say you were in the potential region, that is, look at the loop momenta to do this analysis, or did you simply have to be in the right region of the external kinematics? No, no, we needed to expand the loop integral in the, in the right region. So it was not only an expand. So, so the differential sense, equation was derived after doing IVPs, but really just in the potential region. No, okay, so or, I should say the differential equation is valid for the full soft expansion. So, okay. it, so there's just a, like H bar expansion. So yeah. would, you could use these differential equations to calculate the full soft integrals. But yeah. then the boundary condition is such that the differential equation just give you the contribution from the potential region. Uh, so it's it just uh, changing the boundary conditions gives you uh, radiation plus uh, a potential uh, or potential. Okay. Also, did you look at these uh, maps between parameters of the unbound scattering problem and those of the bound scattering problem, like Gregor and uh, Raphael been uh, looking at in this case? Yeah, so we, what we looked at is we calculated explicitly the precession with the Hamiltonian using the EFT, and we checked that, uh, that indeed uh, there's no precession. Uh, but th this kind of, kind of essentially follows trivially from, from their paper. Uh, that you don't even need to use this formula that they gave, but they also show that, um, that there's never a contribution uh, at this order. Uh, okay, thanks. And then Simone has a question. Yeah, if I, it, it's more a quick comment. So there are actually different, different types of observables that are related to the soft uh, radiation modes. One is the, uh, this uh, deflection angle slash impulse that are inclusive. And, and the other is the, uh, you can ask about the imaginary part of the energy levels as defined from the position of poles in the S matrix. And yeah, our, our conjecture about no precession refers to the, uh, the poles, not to the, uh, 
not not to the uh, uh, not to the scattering angle. But uh, but yeah, there, there should be both. Uh, they are priori distinct physical observables, and to be understand interesting to study both. <laughs> Right, so I should clarify that the, the precise statement of their conjecture was that uh, the energy levels remain degenerate uh, to all orders in the quantum mechanical amplitude. Uh, and this including any decay constants that might come from, from considering radiation. But from the classical perspective, uh, this amounts to, to there being not, no precession. Uh, And then David Broadhurst has a question or comment. It's just a thank you, really, to Julio for reminding me of that work by uh, Amati, Cefaloni, and Venanciano. That's 1987, and you've caught up with them. They were really smart guys. Yeah, they were. They calculated this thing uh, 30 years earlier than, uh, than we did uh, for the muscles case. So thank yeah. you, uh, thank you, Gabriele speaking. Okay. Make a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, go for it, Paulo. Yeah, no, just about this um, question of computing things, including radiation. I wonder whether it's similar to what happens in QCD, where, okay, once you add radiation, gluon radiation, the things you have to compute have to be infrared safe. And uh, in a sense, to still talk about a deflection angle as if the final state was a single particle, just two particle state, could be a little tricky. Maybe you have to talk about, you know, like in jet physics, you talk about energy distribution. And maybe you can give a meaning to some effective deflection angle in the presence of radiation, maybe just the, the usual definition of deflection angle is, is not good enough. Well, I, I don't know what you mean by the usual definition, but, uh, but the actual observable should be, should be finite. Uh, so I think it should yeah. be in inclusive. And I think this is kind of stands out of the work by Donald and David and, and Ben, where they used like just from quantum field theory, they derived the, the angle, uh, and you can see in their formulas that they have a piece that essentially looks, or it's called, or it reminds one to, of the of the iconal uh, calculation. And then there's a piece where you actually have to calculate a cut of the amplitude, which uh, in principle is what should cancel any of these any of these infrared divergences. Um, okay. Did you still have a question, Paulo, or? Can I ask a question, Julio? Okay, okay. can you hear me? Yeah, Paulo, we can hear you. Ah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now the question about the universality, if you look at uh, the delta one, uh, mm -hmm. the iconal that you compute in the paper in the massless case, uh, mm -hmm. the delta one depends on the n. Right. So it's not the same for every supergravity. Right. That means that uh, in some way it's not only the graviton that contributes, but also the gravitino. I think that is true for the quantum corrections. Uh, and that delta one that you're referring to, it's pure quantum. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I agree. And uh, indeed, yeah, I didn't mention, but the one loop, well, I think I had it in the, in the slide. So the one loop angle or the one loop phase is quantum and it's not universal. Uh, but, but here I was mostly interested in, in the classical corrections. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks for all those questions. I think we can thank Julio again for a great talk.